If you can believe it, today is the final day in our Ten Commandments sermon series. I was at least expecting like a yes or like a, we made it, we made it. But anyway, for the last eight weeks, we have been studying the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, and learning about a man named Moses and his pretty incredible journey and all the things that God did through him for the nation of Israel. And just a friendly reminder as we get going, uh, we live stream the, this service and our traditional service at 11 uh, every single week live. And then once it's done, we upload them to our church's YouTube account and we categorize all the services and uh, by the sermon series. So if you miss a week because you were sick or you were traveling and you were like, man, I really wanted to hear the sermon about not murdering people, but I wasn't here you can go back and watch that sermon. Uh, but a special thanks to Dale Elijah and to, he's our director of technology and to his whole team who make all that possible every week. Uh, but today we look at the final two commandments and I want to offer to us for the last time why these commandments matter today in our world to you and me just as much as they did to Moses all those years ago. So to begin, the ninth commandment, we read about it in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 16. It says this, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So what does it mean to bear false witness? Simply put, it means to lie. It means to not tell the truth. And this can happen in a lot of different ways. And I would suggest in the world that we live in today, this is a commandment that needs to be taken especially, seriously, with some extra attention given to it. Because all any of us have, despite what some might say in this world today, and it's the same as it was in the ancient world, all any of us really still have is our word. And when we say something out loud or we type it with our fingers in the world that we live in, we want to believe what we're saying is a truthful and accurate statement. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, what about the statement, well, pastor, actions speak louder than words. Yeah, I agree that that also is a true statement, but I would suggest that words are still some of the most powerful things any of us can have. Think about these few examples. When you take a vow or you make an oath of some sort, you do it with your mouth, with your words. When you make a deal with someone or you make a promise to them, you do it with your words. When you tell someone that you're going to do something, you need to do it and you use your words. You see, our words can build someone up. It can brighten their day. It could change their lives by just sending a quick word of encouragement over a text or making that short phone call to let someone know you're thinking about them, uh, sending a quick encouraging email to a coworker. All of those things are so important. If you take more than two or three minutes to write a handwritten note or a thank you card, that's like earth shattering in today's world. All of those things offer encouragement. They offer love. They offer hope. Three things I think we can all agree we need a little more of in our day-to-day -day lives. But while words can do good, they can just as easily do harm. We can use our words very simply, very easily to humiliate someone. When we humiliate someone, we can take away their reputation. We can take away their credibility. And that could be something we say directly to the person, but we know that it's usually not. We say it to a group of people without that person being there. Or we live in the online world where you could say something online about someone. And then it's there forever. This can damage a person individually. It can hurt their family. It can hurt their livelihood. I think maybe we can all think of a time that someone was said something, someone said someone else about something that maybe wasn't true or the full story, and it did harm to them. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but when we live in the social media world, once something's posted, you can't ever take it back. You might delete it, but a screenshot is there. The record is there. So we have to be careful with what we say Online, And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I'm not online very much. Well, think about your kids or maybe your grandkids, because they, I almost promise you, are online. And research shows how much time younger generations are spending online. And there's also research that shows the hurt that goes on online. 
And that's not going to change, I don't know, if ever. But when we think about the root of this particular commandment, it's a commandment to not harm or to not hurt others with our words. Well, maybe you're thinking, you know, pastor, I I get this, you know, but what, what about the phrase, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. I don't think so. I think that's a cutesy little phrase, but I know words can do a tremendous amount of harm. And at, at the core, the ninth commandment calls us to be honest, to be truthful, and I would suggest kind with our words towards one another. And as I've tried to do every week, I want to think about this particular commandment through the lens of Jesus as well. There is one person who also had uh, false accusations presented against him in Scripture. He had false witness spoken against him, and it ultimately led to his death by crucifixion on a cross. You, of course, know I'm talking about Jesus. People for years, his entire public ministry, all three years of it, from the age he was 30 to 33, they lied about who Jesus was and what he had come to do. On several occasions in the Gospels, people even accused Jesus of being demon possessed. Like, what? But it's in the Gospels that people slandered and lied and gossiped and called him demon possessed. And so Jesus, probably better than any of us, knew what it meant to be misrepresented. And I wonder if that's why he said this in Matthew chapter 7. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. Jesus says this, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For the judgment that you will give will be the judgment that you get. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say something to your neighbor like, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. When we think about lying or not telling the truth or gossiping, why do we do that? We want to deflect the attention or we want to deflect the spotlight off of us of our own sins, of our own failures and our own shortcomings. And we do that because we don't want to put in the work oftentimes to really fix the parts of us that we know need fixing. We'd rather just say something about someone else and just put the attention on them. But that's not the way Christ calls us to live. That's not the way this commandment calls us to live. So I want to end this commandment by offering you an alternative. At the end of the day, the opposite of bearing false witness, the opposite of lying is humility. The opposite of speaking false witness or lying is by speaking words that build others up, that speak truth into that human being, that help them and encourage them. And we know that the breath we have is a gift from God. So I have to ask you, how are you spending your breath? Are you using the breath that is a gift? Every breath you take, are you using it to build others up with words of life and of hope and encouragement and love? Or are you using your words to deflect from you, to do harm to them, just to make yourself feel better for a moment? Simply put, the ninth commandment, practice humility and don't lie. We now come to the the final in the 10th commandment. And that's pretty exciting that we've made it here. I just have to say that. But the 10th commandment says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now covet, not a typical word you'd hear every single day in our society. But if you look it up in a dictionary, it means you yearn to possess or to have something. In scripture, the word can also be translated to mean lust. So it means that we shouldn't lust after our neighbors, anything. You see, go with me on this. The first commandment and the 10th commandment, they kind of form a bracket around all of the rest of them. They all deal with the human heart. The first commandment you'll remember tells us that we should have no other gods before our God. 
And then the last commandment deals directly with all of the other gods that we humans tend to worship when we get our priorities wrong. This starts to look like the material possessions or even the people that we are prone to covet. And in many ways, coveting is often the motivation behind the violation of all of the other nine commandments. Coveting itself can be a form of idolatry. It can lead us to misuse God's name, to work on the Sabbath, or to dishonor our parents. It's sometimes behind the violence we show towards other human beings. And it is, by definition, at the center, the center of adultery and stealing. Let me take scripture and make it practical for you. Uh, What happens to you when somebody tells you, you can't have that? You want it. Even if it's something silly, you're like, ooh, now I want it because I can't have it. Uh, Here's another example. What day of the week do you most crave (laughs) Chick-fil-A? Sunday, right? They're close. Chick-fil-A said, "Mm mm-mm, you can't have my chicken today. And we're like, I need it today. Here's another example. That speed limit says 35 miles an hour. How fast are you driving? 40. 40. Thank you for your honesty. Good. Didn't break the ninth commandment. 42. Do I have any 45s in the room? Woo. We got an honest church this morning. But I think that's all of us. That's human nature. I mean, you think about how many movies or shows that has the big sign next to the red button that says, do not touch. And our heart goes, I want to touch that button. I want to see what happens in that moment. When we're told that we can't have something, or if we ever hear God say, you shouldn't do that, we just mm, have that human tendency to want it even more. In the book of Romans in the New Testament, Paul writes this in chapter 7, verse 7. He said, this is so honest, I love it. He said, I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, but sin, Seizing an opportunity in the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness, right? God made this commandment, the last one, because it encompasses all of the others. Think back to the very beginning of the Bible. God created an unbelievable garden. It was perfect in every way and said, you can't have that fruit, Adam and Eve. And what do they do? Straight to that, straight to the tree. And coveting is often the deepest motivation behind our violation of all the other commandments. In a way, the Ten Commandments, or this Tenth Commandment, addresses our human heart. And it's a reminder for us of how we are called to live versus maybe what we are living today. And I want to offer to you, if you are somebody who really struggles with this particular commandment, you covet a lot in your life and you know this about yourself, there are three alternatives and three antidotes I want to leave you with if this is something that you struggle with in your heart. Three things to help you live a life within your means or to help you live a life of contentment. Those three things are this, practice a life of generosity, practice a life of gratitude, And practice a life that's filled with love. If you do those three things, you will not experience the urge or the temptation or the desire to covet near as often because you're filling yourself with those three things. Gratitude, generosity, and love. So now you've learned the Ten Commandments. The last thing I want to leave you with is a reminder as to why we have them. We read this in the last little bit of Exodus 20, verse 18. It says this, all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the ram's horn and the mountains surrounded by smoke. When the people saw it, they trembled at a distance. They said, you speak to us and we will listen. They said to Moses, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. Moses responded to the people, don't be afraid. For God has come to test you so that you will fear him and you will not sin. You see, the Ten Commandments, what I've been trying to say for the last five weeks is that they are guide rails and they are guideposts of how we are to live our lives today. They help keep us on the straight and the narrow. They help us stay on the path of righteousness. They're meant to offer us a different way of living than a lot of us see in the world around us. The way that Christ would call us to live. 
I want to show you this as we wrap it up. This is something that I have on my office that I see every day. If you're in the back, it says, the Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. You probably won't have a hard time believing this. I bought this at Cracker Barrel uh, years ago. But it's a funny thing, and yeah, we laugh at it, and we say, ha ha, but it's one of those things that reminds me every single day when I go into my office and when I leave my office, I have to ask myself, Robert, are you obeying the commandments that God has placed on your life? And I ask you that question this morning as we end this series, are you obeying the Ten Commandments that God has placed in your life? And these aren't commandments to hurt you or to say, well, you can't do that because I said so. But these commandments were given to Moses and those people all those years ago, just as they're given to us today, because God loves you. And God wants what is best for you. Just like a parent oftentimes has to discipline their child with love, God the Father does the same to us. And these 10 commandments are guideposts or something that helps us stay on the straight and narrow. And God I hope every time you see them, every time you read them, every time you remember them, you'll be reminded how much God loves you and how much God cares for you. And no, they're not multiple choice, as much as we might wish they were, but they can help you live the best life possible. Thanks be to God. Let's pray.